Now that we discussed Hartree-Fock theory in some length, let's talk about what you would do to go beyond Hartree-Fock theory. So Hartree-Fock, as I mentioned, was an approximation. Um, there are two main approximations you're making in Hartree-Fock theory. Uh, one is generally that you're solving the Hartree-Fock equations through the use of some atomic orbital basis set. That is, we're using basis functions that look like the hydrogen atoms that look like S, P, D, and F, etc. type functions and using those as guesses for what the orbitals in atoms and then uh, this readily extends to molecules as well. We have to include some finite number of atomic orbitals in that basis set and in principle we would need an infinite number of atomic orbitals to reproduce uh, the exact energy uh, of whatever these shape these functions end up needing to be t needing to take. We would need a complete basis set in order to get the exact answer. So it, even if we had a complete basis set, there's still another approximation in Hartree-Fock theory, and that is the way in which electron repulsion is treated. We treat that, that in Hartree-Fock through Coulomb and exchange integrals that we talked about, and uh, that so-called mean field theory, that the electrons don't feel each other explicitly, but they feel kind of the average of the effect of all the density of the other electrons. And the difference between the exact energy in a full basis set and the Hartree-Fock energy in a full basis set is called the correlation energy. So this correlation energy is the energy you get by going beyond Hartree-Fock and doing the more advanced methods we'll discuss below. So this, uh, this approximation in how you treat uh, electron repulsion is the second main approximation in Hartree-Fock. And in any atomic or molecular calculation, these are going to be your two main concerns. It's how many basis functions can I afford to use because these, cal these calculations become quite uh, computationally expensive quite quickly with increasing number of atomic orbitals in your basis set. And how accurately can I treat electron repulsion because the more accurately you, re you treat that, the more expensive your calculation becomes as well. So some concerns we have related to the atomic orbital basis set. Um, some uh, nomenclature you might hear referred to it includes the zeta level, and that's the number of functions for each angular momentum shell. So, for example, in the hydrogen atom, if we approximate it, it, our hydrogen atom to have one, or, well, hydrogen isn't a good example, let's say helium. If we approximate our helium atom to have just one s function in our basis set, then we're probably not going to get the best result we can get. Whereas if we include two or three or four or however many, however many larger number of S functions in that basis set, we're going to get a better and better answer and a lower and lower energy as we add in more functions. Um, polarization refers to going to angular momentum beyond what you would expect about the valence of whatever atoms you have. So if you have a carbon atom, for example, you would expect that you have electrons in the S and the P shell, that you have 1s, 2s, and 2p electrons. But in fact, due to how electrons interact with each other, in order to get the exact result, you would need to include d functions and even f, g, and at, in principle, an infinite number of angular momentum functions in order to get the value right. But in, in practice, once you start adding d and f functions, things like carbon atoms start giving you very good energies. So that's polarization. Um, diffuse functions are things which have a small exponent in how they decay, so they're very large and they're very spread out. This allows atoms to respond to very subtle influences in what uh, their environment is doing to them and how they interact with other electrons. This is particularly important for things like anions because anions are less bound by their nucleus and the electrons, the valence electrons are much more spread out. Then there's various types of basis sets which have been developed and are just kind of canned and put into black box in commercial programs. Uh, the main two types of basis sets are either popal sets or dunning sets. Popal sets usually have numbers and dashes and a G, as I have in these names down here, like names like STO3G, 321G, 631G star. Um, this is in the computational chemistry class, so I'm not going to explain what all these things mean in detail, but uh, those are popal sets. They were developed first and uh, and developed uh, early on in computational chemistry and they were the first attempt to kind of get some systematic basis sets going for different atoms. Then Dunning sets are things that have names like CCPVDZ, CCPVTZ. If they have diffuse functions, they have AUG in front of them.
But these functions were uh, more modern. They were developed in the late 80s, early 90s, and are designed to systematically converge to a complete basis set. So including more and more functions going from augccpv dz, which means double zeta, to tz, which means triple zeta, then quadruple zeta, etc. You're systematically getting closer and closer, and they're designed to converge very well to that complete basis set. Okay, so that forms a continuum all the way from the minimum basis set you can use, which is just a single zeta, all the way up to a complete basis set, which in principle has an infinite number. Then in terms of uh, electron repulsion methods, there are a variety of methods to choose there as well. Um, one which is very, very common, not necessarily post-Hartree-Fock, but kind of a different onsets altogether, is density functional theory. In density functional theory, you're, do you're not working with wave functions b at all, but instead working in terms of electron densities. And these have put all the magic away in terms of the thing we can't solve exactly in something called an exchange correlation functional. These things have names like B3LYP, B97, PBE, M052X. They'll have names like that, usually acronyms of the people who uh, founded them, their uh, acronym of their last name, or like the year that they were developed, like 1997 or 2005. Then there's other methods which actually include uh, the effect of determinants which are not the ground state. So the, the approximation that a wave function is just one determinant, which is a ground state, like for example, if we had a beryllium atom, it's four electrons being 1s2, 2s2. That's an approximation. And you actually need to include the effect of all excited state determinants, all determinants where the electrons are in higher orbitals, like 2p, 3s, 3d, etc., all the way up to infinity, all the way up to infinity. Um, those excited determinants are included uh, in things like Muller plus at perturbation theory, uh, very commonly used MP2, which is a second order perturbation theory beyond Hartree Fock. So that uh, perturbatively uh, corrects for the fact that this is an approximation for electron repulsion and includes all of these doubly excited determinants where we have pairs of electrons being excited together. And then usually does a pretty qualitatively good job at describing a lot of chemical properties. And one which is getting very advanced is coupled cluster theory, which is uh, more sophisticated than MP2. It has acronyms like CC singles doubles, couple cluster singles doubles, triples, quadruples, however far you want to go. And uh, this includes a lot of products of these excitations here. And uh, couple cluster theory up through triples or perturbative triples, CCSD parenthesis T is often called the gold standard of quantum chemistry because it often gives very, very good results which are very close to experiments uh, for chemical properties when you use a large enough basis set. Then there's configuration interaction. Um, same type of nomenclature as coupled cluster. You have s configuration interaction, singles, doubles, triples, quadruples, however far you want to go. Um, it, some of these, the lower uh, number of excitations aren't used as much. There are some problems with that uh, as you extend to larger systems. But what is in principle the exact answer for how electrons repel each other in a given basis set is called full configuration interaction or full CI. So the, the exact way that electrons repel each other within a given atomic orbital basis set is represented by full CI. You include all possible determinants for all possible uh, configurations of electrons in there. And then if you were to do full CI in a complete basis set, you would have in principle an exact answer. Now I have exact in quotations because there are still approximations that are being made. We're not, this isn't the exact physical system. We still have approximations that we're making. We're making the approximation that the nucleus is fixed. We're making the approximation that there isn't relativity. We're making the approximation that there aren't things like quarks or other things. We're making all sorts of approximations within um, standard non-relativistic quantum mechanics. But within the Born-Oppenheimer approximation, that nuclei are stationary, and within uh, non-relativity, this is the exact answer in reference to quantum chemistry. So 
Uh, there are a lot of applications now in modern quantum chemistry where you're having applications which are reaching very high levels of accuracy and getting very close to experiment for very many properties. But uh, the limitations of how long computation time takes for things is still limiting the system size for how large of things we can use for very, for very accurate things. So um, for things which are very, very accurate, we can do that for, you know, perhaps a couple dozen atoms and for reasonably qualitative results uh, the best methods out there nowadays are doing uh, many hundreds of atoms so uh, quantum chemistry is definitely poised to play a bigger and bigger role in in uh, chemical in chemical applications and predicting uh, chemical properties in the future as well as today as computational power continues to get better and our algorithms and software get better as well